get started. So before I do that, I just want to thank uh, uh, from the University of Kentucky, Carolyn Weber is uh, her research that she's going to share with you. It involves marijuana, uh, the legalization of marijuana. And so she's going to use a lot of that research as the basis for what she shares with us today. And we're also going to find that the marijuana legalization, and perhaps if we even go back to prohibition and alcohol legalization, will give us models that we can understand how the government would take something that formerly was illegal and then make it uh, legal. And so in the legalization topic, but rather than hearing me discuss it, let's go ahead and welcome uh, Dr. Weber. So go ahead, Dr. Weber, when you're ready, we're happy to have you. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Bill, um, for having me here tonight. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my slides. Um, and uh, so, you know, Bill sort of shared that, that, you know, you're here tonight to sort of think about uh, legalizing illicit drugs. And um, like Bill said, my expertise is in recreational marijuana. Um, and so I'm going to sort of talk a little bit about, you know, how we might think about this problem, at least from the perspective of an economist, which is, which is my training, um, and, uh, and sort of talk about some of the evidence then um, in the particular context of the recreational marijuana market, which is my particular area of expertise. And then um, you know, these are my views, um, which are, you know, even potentially incomplete, and I'm more than happy to answer uh, any questions that you might have or other things you might be thinking about that I may not have thought to mention um, afterwards. So um, when the outline of this talk, I'm going to give a really brief background about recreational marijuana legalization. I'm going to talk sort of broadly about how we might think about some of the potential benefits and drawbacks of drug legalization. Um, and then talk about um, sort of evidence on the potential benefits of recreational marijuana legalization, evidence on the potential drawbacks, and, and then finally uh, conclude. So a little bit of background on recreational marijuana. The median U.S. voter favors legalization, which certainly hasn't always been the case. Um, and so it's, you know, certainly gaining a lot of traction. It's becoming a really important uh, policy issue that's being discussed more and more. Um, recreational marijuana is now legal in 20 states, as well as the District of Columbia. And 12 of these states currently have operation, operational recreational marijuana um, stores, meaning you can actually buy um, and, and sell marijuana not in the state, not just legally um, hold it or consume it. Um, and many more of the states in this list are, are sort of in the process of setting up their own um, recreational marijuana markets. Uh, the states have chosen wildly different tax and regulatory structures. Um, and, you know, we won't get into this a lot tonight, at least not in this talk, although I'm happy to answer more questions about it. But it, it's just been super, it's super interesting to think about all the different ways that states might go about this. Um, retail excise tax rates range from zero to 37%. So that's a huge variation in sort of taste for taxation. Um, of course, there are other types of taxes that they've also implemented. Every state is taxing marijuana at a, at a positive rate. Um, and some states are also imposing their retail sales taxes on marijuana and some are not. Um, and on the regulatory side, you know, states have taken very different uh, sort of stances on how they might think about enforcement. Are they going to go and check on each uh, dispensary that, that's selling marijuana many times a year, um, as in the case of Washington, or perhaps never at all? Um, for example, uh, you know, that, that's more consistent with, with what might be going on in a state like Oregon. Um, so, you know, lots of different sort of tastes and choices around that. Um, as well as how many firms they're going to let enter. Um, Washington didn't let many firms enter, um, and the firms they let enter had to have a lot of capital going in, uh, whereas Oregon let everyone in pretty much. Um, you know, you had to pass, you know, there were certain rules, you know, certain qualifications you had to have to become a marijuana um, store owner, but conditional on those rules, everyone was in. Um, whereas Washington chose a select few based on a lottery. Um, so that changes, obviously, the nature of competition um, and just the supply of marijuana uh, 
or again, market was flooded with marijuana after they legalized. Um, and you know, this was you know, somewhat challenging in the sense that they had much more supply than they did even demand for marijuana in their state. Um, whereas Washington, you know, sort of tried to really manage supply so they would always um, just meet demand. So, um, you know, there's just huge variation in how states have tried to do that. And I think um, in that, a ton of lessons um, for thinking about how uh, to, to sort of legalize well. Um, not quite the conversation for tonight, but, but a, a very interesting conversation nonetheless, and one I'm happy to expound on a little bit um, later. It's a huge industry. Um, you know, legal cannabis is currently the fifth most valuable U.S. agricultural product in the United States. Um, this is this statement is both really interesting and also a little bit uh, deceptive um, in the sense that uh, this doesn't mean that we're selling as much cannabis as we are wheat. Uh, this means we're selling cannabis at a much, much higher price than we are wheat. And we're also selling a lot of cannabis. Um, so, you know, this it, cannabis is sort of slot here as fifth is going to come down a lot as, as prices come down. Prices have come down a lot um, as we legalized uh, marijuana. Um, but it's also going to rise as more states legalize and, and demand within those states expands. So it's hard to know exactly where we'll end up. Um, and a lot of that sort of depends on, you know, ultimate demand for marijuana as well as the ultimate price. Some argue that the price of marijuana will one day uh, you know, reach the price of weed and, and others think it'll remain a lot higher. And, and, and I think we just don't know yet. Um, so, but anyway, nonetheless, it's, it's a big industry. Um, and it's something to, to, to take notice of. Um, so when we're thinking about sort of legalizing an illicit drug, which of course, marijuana is one example. Um, as an economist, we always like to think about sort of costs and benefits. How do we weigh you know, there's going to be trade-offs to, to everything in life. Um, and how are we going to sort of weigh those? And what, if we had to make a list, what would they even look like? Um, so, you know, this is certainly not an exhaustive list, um, but it's a list of, I think, the things that I hear most often um, discussed um, and, and probably a pretty good list um, that'll cover many things, but I'm certainly happy to talk about other things that, that could belong on this list as well. Um, so potential benefits, um, dollars, um, government dollars, um, assuming that you're, you, you know, assuming that you're of the belief that, um, you know, there's some value to, to, to uh, providing um, dollars to the government um, for various goods and services um, that they might provide, or even just having this replace another source of revenue. Um, then this is potentially a benefit, right? We, if we legalize an illicit good, we do get to tax it. Um, and this can raise um, tax revenue from a source that we didn't have um, previously. Also, to the extent that we were spending money on enforcement um, by trying to you know, uh, deal with an illicit drug market, uh, those dollars are now potentially saved, although we have to spend some enforcement dollars to sort of um, regulate um, and manage this new uh, legal market as well. Um, we can potentially reduce the black market, right? Marijuana did not not exist before it was sold in the black market. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the big goals, if you sort of think about the two big goals, if you ask a state, you know, why are you legalizing marijuana? Why are you thinking about it? The two, you know, the two biggest things you hear out of policymakers' mouths are dollars, tax revenue dollars, and, and, and eliminating or reducing the black market. Um, it's hard to get rid of black markets. I mean, there's an alcohol and a cigarette black market still. Um, so I, I think it's not fair to say eliminate, but I certainly the goal of reducing the black market um, is a reasonable one. One that doesn't really have, I don't think, a ton to do with marijuana, but certainly talked about a lot the context of other illicit drugs is, is sort of safer drug use. If you make it legal, um, it can be, be safer um, to use or, or in a variety of different ways. Um, and uh, the number four is I, potentially a little bit specific to, to marijuana, although it could apply to other drugs as well. But potentially there are positive externalities because of substitution. If I substitute away from opioids or alcohol, um, there are potentially benefits to that. There could also be costs, um, but there could be some benefits and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and then um, as you legalize illicit drugs, 
Uh, this is going to reduce mass incarceration um, be, simply by, 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 by virtue of not, you know, arresting anyone for, for possessing or selling um, if it's being sold in the legal market, marijuana. Um, and, you know, there's been big uh, gaps, big racial gaps um, in arrest rates, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, on the drawback side, there are really important drawbacks. Um, there are negative externalities or internalities um, associated with, with increased use of the drugs. Um, and we'll talk about some of the evidence there. Um, and to the extent that it's not federally legalized, when, you know, when Washington wakes up and legalizes marijuana, um, that has spillover effects, right? It's now a lot easier for, for example, individuals from Idaho to have access. Um, and so, you know, Washington's choices have, you know, significant effects on, on neighboring jurisdictions. Um, so um, that's sort of an outline. And now I'm going to talk a little bit about some of these things in a little bit more detail and give a little bit of data on this. So um, Colorado and Washington collected about 1% of their total general revenue in cannabis taxes in 2020. Um, other states uh, reported less than that. So Colorado and Washington were, were the first two uh, legal markets up and running. So we might think they could be the biggest for that reason, but there's lots of other individual heterogeneity, which we won't get into. Uh, but that gives you a sense of kind of how big um, it is in terms of tax revenue, at least for now. Um, to the extent that marijuana and alcohol or cigarettes are substitutes, um, which there is evidence that this is the case, um, those tax revenues, of course, will fall when marijuana is legalized. When we legalize marijuana, we start consuming more marijuana. Um, if they're substitutes, that means we're going to consume less alcohol, less cigarettes. Um, and so the, the tax revenue from alcohol and cigarettes is going to fall. Um, so Miller and So estimate in a new 2021 paper estimate that um, about 40% of Washington's cannabis revenue um, came from pre-existing sources. So um, is now going to, you know, dis you know be disappear from those sources. Um, so, you know, that's a really important thing to consider as we think, at least in, in the marijuana market, about sort of legalizing this. Um, beyond spending on the administration of the new market, um, recreational marijuana tax revenue dollars have gone towards a bunch of different things. And this is just sort of, you know, a list of, of different possible, you know, different uses that states have, have used these dollars on. Um, and so there's a lot of spending on health, um, some of it's substance abuse directly or, or other things. Um, about 60% of states have spent it on crime or enforcement of one variety or another. 40% um, of states have sent the money, part, at least part of the money to their general fund. 40% um, of states have sent part of the money to schools. 20% um, of states have spent part of their money on criminal justice. Um, and 20% of states have, have spent money um, on actually trying to give money to researchers so that we can learn more about uh, recreational marijuana uh, for you know, one particular question about it or another. Um, and there's others as well, but this kind of highlights some of the big things. So, so you know, certainly as you raise dollars, um, those dollars can be spent on different things that the state views um, as priorities um, or can um, potentially reduce other forms of taxation. Um, the black market. So the best evidence we have suggests that sort of the within state black market has been reduced, but not entirely eliminated. Um, you know, in Washington, uh, 25 to 40% more is consumed than sold. Part of that is because of home use. Um, but uh, that still suggests that part of it's potentially being purchased in the black market. Um, we don't have great, we don't have any direct evidence, um, but indirect, we can kind of guess that there, you know, the black market isn't completely um, gone, dramatically reduced, but not completely eliminated. Um, other states have made a variety of regulatory missteps that have sort of dampened, at least in the short run, their ability to. Um, Reduce the black market. Colorado allowed at home cultivation of up to 99 plants with doctor permission. And so it was actually really hard for them initially to sort of crack down on the black market because they'd see someone, you know, have a big row in a residential area and they would have to sort of figure out whether it was legal or, or part of the black market. Um, 
they've since sort of addressed that, but this was a big challenge for them early on. Um, you know, and another, you know, Oregon, as I sort of mentioned earlier, let many, many firms in, um, flooded the market with marijuana and engaged in very little enforcement. And this really uh, hampered their ability to sort of crowd the black market because when there's too much marijuana sitting in the legal market, where did it go? Well, it went back to the black market or was sold um, to other states. Um, and so, you know, I think, you know, it's, it's clearly a place where we, the black market can be dramatically reduced as it was in Washington, but the types of um, regulatory decisions surrounding that are, are really important. Um, and there's many other examples. We could talk about this for, for a while, um, but I'll stop there. So, um, of course, there's another type of black market activity, which is not sort of within my own state, but, you know, Oregon selling back east or California selling back east um, or to any other state uh, where it's not legal. And, um, you know, that's hard to stop. And I think, you know, the, the evidence on how much that's been reduced by legalization is, is still up for debate. And it, it's really um, difficult because it's still, the incentives are still really strong, right? So, you know, in California, it, you could get, if you took some marijuana that you had grown legally and you sold it, um, to, to another state, you potentially could get, um, a, a lot more money for that, uh, marijuana than you could if you sold it legally in your own state. And so those incentives are still big. And until, um, we sort of legalize federally, if that ever, um, comes to pass, um, those incentives are going to kind of exist. Um, so that type of black market is probably not going to be reduced that much um, by um, by legalization at the state level. Um, then, in terms of uh, positive externalities, um, you know, there's some evidence that recreational marijuana is a substitute for alcohol and opioids. Um, you know, upon legalization of recreational marijuana. There's some evidence suggesting that in response to that, alcohol and opioid consumption has declined. Although I will say it's still preliminary and I would sort of say suggestive. Um, I think that the authors would agree with that description. Um, but to the extent that that is true, um, and um, there is kind of you know one important fact that, that that's relevant on this particular health thing. We'll talk a lot more about health on the, on the negative side in a little bit. Um, but one thing that's great about recreational marijuana is it's actually very hard to die from an overdose. Um, you can get really high, you can panic and go to the ER. Um, it can be really bad for you, but you're unlikely to die, unlike um, alcohol and opioids. So um, there are potential uh, sort of po positive externality benefits um, as individuals substitute away um, from you know, something like alcohol or opioids to marijuana. But of course, that's only really interesting if it's those individuals who would have overdosed on alcohol or opioids that are, it's those individuals that are substituting toward um, marijuana. We just don't have enough data yet to know whether or not that's the case. So some potentially interesting evidence here, but I think still really early. And you can tell, so, you know, the first states, uh, legalized in 2012 and, and had markets in 2014. And you're hearing me say now, and you'll keep hearing me say, you know, we have some evidence and it's still suggestive and we're still learning. It takes a while to get data and, and learn about these things after um, they happen. And this is, you know, a really interesting part of um, you're sort of seeing the process in, in real time here. Um, mass incarceration reduction. So here's a look at the incarceration issue uh, by race for all drugs. So, um, People, you know, blacks and whites report relatively similar rates of illicit drug use in the past month. Um, but uh, the drug related arrests um, are about two and a half times larger for blacks than whites. Um, so this has received a lot of press um, and uh, is, is, is a concerning um, issue as we think about this. Um, what happens when we legalize marijuana? So you can see sort of in Washington pre-legalization, so, so 2012 and prior, um, you know, it was legalized during 2012. So that's kind of the middle year. Um, there were big gaps um, in marijuana arrest, possession arrest rates. Um, so just having some marijuana in your possession um, 
led to much higher rates of arrests uh, by of African Americans than whites. Um, so this gap persists in this particular example. Um, and then it's certainly the case that you know once we legalized marijuana, that arrests fell dramatically. Um, but uh, the sort of the gap uh, between whites and African Americans um, potentially persisted. Um, so, um, so kind of a, depending on sort of how you want to read that, um, you know, both benefits and, and, and remaining challenges there. Um, what about potential drawbacks? So, you know, one of the things I said, one of the things that I sort of said that's really important to think about here is, uh, you know, potential, um, externalities and internalities. Um, so before I get into that, I want to sort of define what I mean by that. So what we really are worried about is, is things outside of the market. So if, if people wake up and think, well, marijuana is bad for me, I don't want it. Um, you know, that's, that's something inside the market. You know, if nobody wants to buy marijuana, then there won't be much demand for it. Um, and that'll play into, you know, how much is consumed and the price and so on. And that's sort of within the market. Um, but what where it gets to be a challenge is when my own decisions about marijuana affect other people. Um, so these are externalities. Um, so I engage in marijuana consumption and this affects somebody else. Maybe I engage in marijuana consumption and then I'm a crazy driver and I cause a traffic fatality, right? Now it's not just me, um, but also the other people who, who were in that other car that obviously care a great deal um, about uh, the fact that I just consumed marijuana. Um, and then we have internalities, um, which is actual consequences to yourself that you may not have um, appreciated. So, you know, an activity an individual engages in for which that individual does not fully consider the long term costs and benefits of that activity to themselves. So perhaps you thought, oh, I'll just smoke marijuana occasionally and it'll be fun. And you don't realize that you're actually gonna become addicted and eventually have cannabis use disorder. Um, or, oh, you know, I'll do this. And then I don't realize, you know, that eventually I'm going to potentially move on from marijuana to opioids or something else um, and use marijuana as a, as a gateway drug. So um, we really care about both of these things. Um, and uh, understanding the magnitudes of those are gonna be really important for thinking about um, legalizing uh, any illicit drug and, and certainly uh, marijuana. Um, so we are still definitely learning about the consequences of legalizing marijuana. Um, here's some evidence uh, we sort of collectively, not certainly not me, um, although a bit of the evidence will be my own work um, that we have sort of so far. Um, you know, recreational marijuana use is probably rising after legalization. Um, you can look here at this picture and you can see in, you know, in Washington, Colorado and Oregon, um, there are big rises over time. And those rises, of course, are bigger um, than they are for the whole US. Uh, but it's a little bit complicated because um, lots of different things are going on. And obviously, like Oregon, Washington, and Colorado already had much higher rates of marijuana consumption before legalization. Um, and so it's a little bit hard to interpret. I think probably the easiest line to think about is Oregon's because um, they had sort of this nice sort of stable trend upwards. Um, and then all in the span of a single year in 2015, um, they both legalized and started selling um, quite rapidly um, and in a really large way. And so you can see kind of in 2015 after that legalization, a big sort of uh, spike up um, in uh, consumption. Um, in Colorado and Washington, they legalized in 2012, um, meaning they made it legal for you to possess it, legal for you potentially to grow it. Um, and you can see that it potentially starts to go up, but you have to kind of think about relative to what trend. Um, and then in 2014, um, uh, it, they started to sell it and so on. And then you can try to sort of think about those trends and, and I won't get into all those details. But um, so I think, you know, it, it's potentially rising. Um, there's a lot of literature starting to digest, you know, by how much and on average, right? I gave you the example of Oregon, but is that true everywhere? Um, and I think we're still learning a lot about that. Um, 
in terms of sort of other outcomes, sort of downstream outcomes, um, there is good evidence that um, it increased uh, cannabis use disorder. Um, it's increased ER visits, um, particularly in the short run, um, as new individuals are, are, are getting accustomed um, to using this. Um, and um, on the flip side, there's no real evidence that 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 there that it's that marijuana is a gateway to harder drugs or or crime. So we don't. We don't, at least yet, although again, there's only a couple of states that have had it this market legal long enough to really say much. Um, and you know, as we get a lot more states um, and add them to our sample, we'll have a lot more power to say a lot more things. Um, but so far, there's not a lot of evidence um, that marijuana is a gateway to harder drugs or, or to increased crime rates. Um, I have some work with co-authors suggesting that there's no evidence yet of increased traffic fatalities. Um, marijuana drivers are, are certainly very impaired, um, but uh, simulation studies would suggest that um, potentially not um, in a way that's gonna inspire a lot of fatal accidents. You know, if you're a marijuana driver, you wanna keep a lot of space, you wanna drive slow. Um, if you're if you're high, so it's it's unlikely you're going to probably cause a lot of fatal accidents. Certainly not none, but it's not clear that fatal accidents are probably the most um, clear mechanism for this. And then um, potentially lowers or at least doesn't raise teen marijuana use. Some evidence that it potentially lowers teen marijuana use. You might be like, wait, why is that? Well, it turns out that you know if I'm selling marijuana on the street as a drug dealer, um, I don't really care how old the person is who's buying it probably. Um, but if I'm a legal store, um, at least in the state of Washington where a lot of this evidence is from, and I'm and someone pops into my store five, six, seven, eight times a year um, and tests to see whether I'll sell to a minor, uh, let me tell you, I am pretty keen on not selling to minors. Um, and of course, I can go buy it for uh, my teenage friend. Um, but that, you know, adds an extra layer and an extra step. And um, so, so far, the evidence is sort of tentatively suggestive that it at least doesn't change marijuana use and potentially lowers it. But I do expect uh, there to be variation across states, um, depending on sort of how they, they enforce it and, and manage this market. Um, spillovers to neighboring jurisdictions. Um, this is really a challenging problem. Um, like I sort of said earlier, um, you know, so we have some evidence um, that suggests that when, when Washington legalized, um, now neighboring jurisdictions, Oregon and Idaho, um, could have access to marijuana by driving over the border and um, consuming it. And we have evidence um, that sort of it, in de facto increased um, legalization in Oregon by about 18% um, and made uh, parts of Idaho about 72% uh, de facto legal. Um, and you might say, well, those are really different numbers. Why is that? Well, it was a lot easier to get uh, marijuana um, in Oregon uh, prior to legalization in Oregon uh, than it was in Idaho. And so um, you know, the appeal of driving over to the Washington border probably a lot more um, appealing for, for Idaho residents. Um, it, this is tough to address. It, it's hard to keep people out of Washington if they want to drive over the border and, and buy it. Um, but of course, it would be eliminated with federal legalization. So this is really a conversation around sort of states making individual choices. Um, so that's most of what I had to say. So I'll just sort of conclude to say, you know, drug legalization creates important trade-offs. Um, that must be weighed, you know, as we try to decide whether this should be pursued or not. Um, this talk obviously has not been about sort of the morality or, or, or the overall ethics of, of, of drug legalization, but rather it's just sort of different types of costs and benefits we might think about um, as an economist. Um, and, you know, I talked about the recreational marijuana market, you know, broadly, it doesn't really matter what market you're talking about. I would, I would suspect that you know, a lot of the questions we ask are the same, but the answers uh, might be different. Um, you know, the, the the extent of, let's say, negative externalities could be a lot larger for other drugs. Um, 
And so it's totally possible, at least theoretically, that you could have a scenario where you might want to legalize some drugs and keep others illegal. You might also want to legalize no drugs or legalize all drugs, right? Um, but there's certainly a spectrum there and, and, and we might evaluate each one differently. So um, that's all I have to say. Um, so I'll go ahead and conclude and then uh, and stop sharing my screen. Um, and I'm happy to take any and all questions um, that you might have. So thank you so much for listening. Okay, thank you very much. So at this phase, I ask you some questions, you know, based on the, the lecture, the talk, and then we open it up uh, for the students. And then if the students want to type any questions in the chat, we can also address them during this time, this interaction. So let me start off by just saying thank you again. I appreciate the amount of effort. That's a lot of information to follow. I wrote several notes and it's just really exciting to see the potential but also the evidence that you provided helps us in another way, which is we know people are going to, this is gonna lead into the first question from this. We know that our opponents are gonna talk about teenagers and they're gonna say, if you make illicit drugs legal, then teenagers are going to have an easier chance of getting it. And you said that uh, the Hansen and the Dilly evidence suggested that in the uh, case of marijuana, there is this potential. Could you just in very plain language explain that the probability of increased teen use is maybe not going to be alarming, or perhaps you might have a different uh, perspective? Yeah, so I mean, I think I, I, I want to sort of underscore what I said and, and just sort of reemphasize that I think part of it has a lot to do with how available it was in the black market previously, and also a lot to do with how the state manages the legal market. Um, so a lot of the evidence that I cited is coming predominantly from the state of Washington, where marijuana was actually fairly easy to get um, on the black market prior to legalization um, and uh, relative to some other states. And um, they took a very hands-on enforcement approach to legalization. Um, they audit the firms a lot. They visit them a lot. They check to see if they're selling to minors a lot, right? Those things are going to play a big role. Um, they let in a limited number of firms so they weren't flooding the market. Um, so all of those things kind of are going to, to play a big role in, in, in teen use. Um, so, you know, in another state where like you couldn't find marijuana anywhere, and then we legalize it and there's no enforcement, that could have potentially different consequences for teen use. And so I think, you know, until, you know, maybe, you know, even once we have like a full 20 states that have legalized sell for a couple of years and we can really see a lot of the evidence, we're not there yet. And so we're still talking a lot of times about evidence um, from a couple of states. Um, that are perhaps you know not random, particularly in terms of how much marijuana they were consuming prior uh, to legalization, as you sort of saw in that figure. And so, um, you know, on the one hand, I think it's it's a potentially you know hopeful message from a state like Washington that you can legalize and not um, increase teen use. But I think at the same time, you know, it's certainly not a universal message, and I think we need to be really careful about. Um, exactly what it means and, and exactly in what context uh, we apply some of these some of this evidence to. When you were referring to the Hansen research, I thought you had explained about the availability and how the people that you get your marijuana from are less likely to sell to a teenager for the same reason they wouldn't sell alcohol. Was that Hansen and was that Dilly's analysis as well? Does Dilly have a different an, a, a different warrant to share as to why they predict that it could go down? No, I mean, I, the, both of those pieces of evidence are just sort of talking about, does it go down? And, you know, I think, you know, the broad discussion, at least that I heard, um, that I've sort of heard is that presumably the mechanism behind sort of the evidence that these papers find is, is sort of tied both to, you know, what's going on in the legal market, what was availability like before, and also, you know, who's willing to sell. But I, I, I mean, you know, that, you know, cigarettes are legal and we still have teen use of cigarettes, right? Um, that's still actually a really big issue. 
Um, so again, I'm not saying that, you know, marijuana use among teens went to zero, right? I'm saying it marginally decreased from where it was in the state of Washington before. And anyway, I, you know, I, you know, I think we just, on the one hand, you know, it's really interesting. On the other hand, I think we have to be really careful about the exact words we're using it and what exactly um, they mean. Certainly it's better than if, you know, certainly it's hopeful in the sense that it, it's much better than if um, it was increasing dramatically. And presumably part of that is, has to do with, um, that, that legal scholars, at least directly, are, are unwilling um, with the proper enforcement to, to sell to minors. Would this be a correct statement? Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but someone makes the assertion that teen drug use is going to go up as a result of making it more available. And my answer to that is that we have evidence from Hansen in 2020, we have the Dilly research that tells us that this is not what we're seeing in the market so far that that may be potentially true, but this research seems to cast doubt on that. Am I fairly accurate? Yes, yeah. Okay, because we just need to be able to make the answer to an audience that already believes that teenagers are gonna go wild with all the drugs that are out there, you know? And, uh, and I think that people forget that you have to uh, have rules as to, you know, what age that we sell to, et cetera. Let's talk about the opioid uh, substitution argument you in the research talked about how uh, the the opioid use could go down because people will substitute marijuana for opioids. And when they do, even alcohol, which is legal, and opioid are much higher risk factors for fatalities and overdose specifically, right? So my question then is, if you could just in plain speaking, just kind of help us to understand what is the probability from your estimate that people will substitute that the opioid I heard in the marketplace was saying something like they can't get the same quality of result from normal pain medication that they had to go to things like, and this may be exaggerated by the right a little bit, but uh, you know, black tar heroin or some sort of like really heavy duty drug to satisfy their opioid addiction because the opioid addiction was just so uh, grippling. Now, it's supposed to be you talking, not me, right? So let me rephrase and just say, how likely do you think the substitution is based on the research? And what other commentary do you think you can make that you feel comfortable in that issue? Yeah, so I mean, that's a really good question. I mean, I, I'm really not a health expert. So I'll sort of say that at the outset. Um, my my sort of you know my read of the, the actual estimation in that paper which is is not my work um is um that there is some suggestive evidence that it potentially declines um and that that's sort of, but you know again uh it's based on a few states there's not a lot of power um for the statistical analysis and we're gonna hopefully learn more um as time goes on um you know, I think that papers maybe. So I think, you know, my, my sort of sense of it is that there's a lot of excitement around um, the potential uh, for marijuana to reduce opioid consumption, um, to reduce alcohol consumption. Um, potentially, we can, although there's a lot within the alcohol marijuana, there's lots of different trade offs. I talked about this one of sort of deaths, but obviously there's lots of other trade offs that we might think about. Um, but I think, you know, do you, that mind, if, do you mind if I still, interject here on that, on yeah. that level? I just, I wanted to have a discussion about quality. Is it possible that a quality discussion fits here in the sense that when we legalize drugs, that there's going to be a certain amount of purity that you wouldn't have in the black market? Or I'm not sure. I just want to stop talking there and say, is purity an issue here that you also feel potentially comfortable discussing? Yeah, so there's purity, right? And then there's also just potency. So one of the things that I didn't mention, but is certainly interesting and relative, relevant in this context is um, that potency of, of marijuana has gone way up um, in, in the wake of legalization. Um, and part of why we sort of don't know a ton about what's gonna happen is because it's a lot more potent um, than marijuana that was consumed in the black market, than marijuana that's been consumed elsewhere in the world. 
Um, and, uh, and, and there's sort of a real reason for that, right? If I was selling black market marijuana, I wanted to harvest it quickly so that no one would catch, you know, so it'd be less likely that I would get caught while I was growing it. Um, the longer you grow marijuana, the more potent it becomes. Um, and so now firms can sort of think about how potent they want to make it. Um, so they're selling a very potent product. Um, and there's been a lot of policy discussion about how potent do we want marijuana? Do we want to regulate potency? Do we want to create incentives to decrease potency? Um, there's just, you know, there's a lot of discussion around that. Um, and uh, without a lot of great answers, but, um, you know, one of the challenging parts is when you have a schedule one, sub it's still a schedule one substance, um, federally, it's actually very difficult to do, um, research, uh, because of sort of some of the particular nature of that schedule one status. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of research that's being done, but, um, you know, still a lot more to be done. Okay. Well, one of the other questions that comes to mind then is going to be the trade-off that you mentioned with regard to the taxation. So there's this shift that's taking place where people are preferring the marijuana product and it, from their wallet standpoint, they're buying fewer cigarettes or less alcohol because they're getting, they're satisfied with their marijuana purchases. And so I guess I would ask it this way. Do you think that the taxes on marijuana having kind of a specified way of spending the money versus the 40, but the potential up to 40% that could have come from cigarettes and alcohol and these other products that are now going to be less likely used, but that was unrestricted money that I could spend as the governor on any of the state's needs. Do you see anything from your research that suggests the idea that this shift or this trade-off might cause some unexpected potential problems or something you may have encountered? Oh, okay, very well, the shrug works for me. I don't know about that because it, it really depends on what they were spending that money on before. You know, they they could be spending it on the same things, honestly, or different, and, and that's just really hard to know. Mm -hmm. But I noticed that you had said that in the, uh, in the breakdown in the first couple of slides, it talked about how, uh, was it the number around 80% or something that had used uh, it for health purposes? You know? That is true. That is true. And a lot of it, and a lot of the health was specifically for substance abuse, right? So, you know, if you were gonna, you know, if, if your question is, do you think that, you know, as a result of marijuana legalization, we're spending more dollars on substance abuse now than we were before, I think the answer to that is yes. Um, I would speculate. Um, but, uh, but beyond that, I'm not totally sure your question, I guess. Yes, I was only wanting to, the teens that our people are going to face are going to make arguments that said, look at the tremendous social benefits that you're going to get. And they're going to come up with these like wildly speculative ways that this new money is going to be spent. And you just gave us a, a huge dent in that analysis that says, well, really, this is just money we were already going to, 40% of this is already money we would, or money that we already would have gotten you know, uh, from other things that, that we trade off. So then that significantly reduces it. Then I just wondered if they, in proposing their drug tax, are going to be much more narrow in how that tax money is spent. So that could actually undermine the, the, the public spending goals, because we need roads and we need other things that uh, at, at a state level uh, I know roads are mainly done federal, but, you know, it's also done at the state. Okay, but that's, I don't need you to comment all that. I just want to know if you had seen that. But let's talk about the black market. And I think this is where I want to finish up with my part of the questions with you. And do we really, I'm making an assumption, and I did listen, but I just, I think this is an assumption that people are going to make in the debate. Are we going to have to really choke the black market to make sure that we reduce it enough to consider the legalization effective? In other words, are they still going to be able to make enough money to the point where the black market will continue to thrive outside of the legalization? So I'm not told like, so is your question like, does the black market need to be choked to consider drug legalization effective or is it what will it take to to reduce the black market or to what extent would we consider this as a if, if someone's going to make the claim that we can reduce black market you know sales 
and that we can put things into the regulated market where the FDA becomes involved or some other government agencies. Well, if you don't do enough damage to the black market, then they're going to continue to prosper the way that they always have. Like you had mentioned, there's even, you know, illegal sale of alcohol and cigarettes, you know, so I'm not saying that, that we destroy the black market in order to consider it a success, but are there going to be people trying to avoid paying taxes? Are going to be people just growing their own and they, and they don't have a license to sell, but there is an opportunity on the black market? Or do you think the quality and the potency issue, you know, that, that, that they lose business, uh, the fact that there's easier ways to get the drug that don't involve crime means that people aren't going to go to the black market. Is it enough? So I just want to know about the effectiveness and please expand in whatever way you can about the effectiveness of regulations and how well the enforcement agents like if is Washington atypical, you know, in the way that they approached it? They are a bit atypical on how much enforcement they've committed to. Um, I think it depends. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll get I'll talk about a couple of things. So first, I'll talk about sort of an interesting Oregon, Washington sort of study that, that we did, which was we looked at um, you know, what happened to sales in Washington border counties the month that Oregon started selling. So if you thought that Oregonians were really happy buying it in the black market, um, of which they had a, a pretty robust black market, then you wouldn't think that they drive over the border to go buy it in Washington. Um, if on the other hand, you think that there's some real uh, added value to buying in the legal market, then you might expect uh, Oregonians to go and drive and buy that mark, buy that marijuana in the legal market in Washington, and then bring it back home. Um, and we find about a forty percent drop uh, in the week that Oregon legalized in uh, in Washington border sales. So suggesting that a lot of Oregonians were, in fact, you know, driving across the border, buying their marijuana legally, and, and bringing it back, and that was their their preference. Um, so I do think there's a taste for legal marijuana um, for a variety of reasons, um, but uh, that alone is not going to, we've learned um, for states that are not Washington, that that alone is not going to eliminate the black market. Um, and a lot of managing that is on the regulatory side, um, you know, letting enough firms in to, to drive prices down enough. Um, that they're competitive with the black market, uh, not letting in too many firms so that you have such an oversupply that you're actually supply the legal market is actually supplying the black market. That's what happened in Oregon. Um, California has its own troubles. Um, California, the way I sort of think about California, um, there's lots of different things actually going on in California, but one of them is they were a huge supplier to the whole nation um, of black market marijuana. And they sort of showed up and said, great news guys, um, we're gonna make you legal. And then they sort of said, bad news, guys, you can only sell to the state of California. Um, and uh, there's just way more marijuana that was being produced uh, in California prior to legalization than Californians can ever consume. Um, and so they've had a really hard time trying to manage the black market um, because they couldn't make all of their illegal sellers legal. Um, they have been reluctant to get rid of them. Um, they're still selling back East and they just, so they just have this really complicated, um, situation. So, you know, I think, um, different states have had really different experiences. And I think a lot of it has to do, um, with the regulatory structure and ultimately may have to do, you know, may change some, um, when we think about different types of black market, right? A lot of California's problem is about selling to other states. Um, once it's federally legal and presumably then you can sell across state lines, um, that part of the black market will sort of technically dissipate um, or disappear, I guess. Um, and, and, and it'll, and we'll have sort of other forms of black market activity only. So I, you know, I, I think it varies and I think states have had really variable experiences. Okay, well, uh, thank you for answering my questions. And more importantly, the students have their own questions. They write debate cases, they have to anticipate arguments that their opponents intend to make and come up with answers. Okay, so at this point, if you have a question, and uh, many of you have been here before, usually what we do is we just ask you to turn your camera on and then, uh, you know, ask your question. Yeah, so my name is Akantika. I go, I'm a seventh grader at Mazik Middle School. And my question was, has any country or place that's like 
that has like legalized or legalized marijuana or just like any type of drug and like does it have more of a like beneficial impact on the country or is it like more harmful or negative it's a good question um and i think you know i'm not the person to probably answer that question i think the thing that's really important to recognize is that there's lots of um trade-offs right like i listed lots of benefits i listed lots of drawbacks and you have to kind of you know if you're trying to decide like is this good or bad you have to add them you have to figure out a way to add them all up um that can be hard to do um you know how do we sort of value all these very diverse um things um and it can be really challenging um if you're interested in like a country that try legal, you know, legalizing drugs and you want to like do some of your own research, you know, Portugal is one of those countries. Um, but I think, you know, it, it, it's really difficult uh, to, 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 to add those things up. You know, economists will try to do cost benefit analysis and put all of these costs and benefits into dollars. I haven't seen one of them for marijuana, um, but it perhaps exists. Um, but it can be really difficult because then, you know, for every life lost, you have to put a dollar value on it and, and so on. And, and it's, it's not easy to do. Uh, does someone else have a question that uh, maybe in the back of your mind, we're using the marijuana discussion to help us understand the legalization from a certain point of view. And then we haven't legalized all these illicit drugs that would be debated about, you know, in this next coming month or you know, in this month of January, but we have legalized marijuana in certain parts of the country and there's research. And so our expert has an understanding about what the process is like. Does anybody have maybe a process question or some sort of question that you're just not clear about how we would collect the tax or, or to what extent the money might be spent? These are gonna be huge issues where people claim benefits is gonna be the idea of the tax revenue and all the good that it's gonna do for society. Does someone have a question? Hello, my name is Angini. I am a seventh grader at Tate's Creek Middle School. So uh, my question is, are these once illegal drugs legalized because they have, um, there have been new health benefits found about them or just to bring in more money? Um, so were they legalized because there were additional health benefits or just to bring in more dollars? Um, so it's a good question. Um, this is treading on the edge of my expertise. Um, you know, marijuana, um, medical marijuana, at least arguably, uh, was originally legalized because of, uh, perceived medical benefits. Um, and so that's a motivation for that. Obviously, recreational marijuana is not really about the medical benefits, um, at least not directly. Um, although indirectly, it can increase access to people who didn't get medical cards and things like that. Um, but it's really not about medical um, issues per se, at least not directly. Um, so my own perception is that um, the legalization of recreational marijuana had less to do with medicinal benefits and more to do with um, tax revenue and the black market um, and other issues sort of surrounding, you know, how do we manage a drug that in, in many cases, you know, was readily accessible, um, at least in states like Washington and Oregon, it was readily accessible um, and yet illegal. And so how, you know, that's a hard equilibrium to keep. Um, and so how, you know, the states had to sort of think about, you know, we either need to sort of, you know, if, if you have something that's, that's both um, illegal and readily available, um, you know, what kind of, how are you gonna manage that in the long run? What's your long run goal? Is your long run goal to let it, people have access? Well, if that's the case, then why is it illegal? If your long run goal is to have, um, no one have access, then why have you made it so, you know, why have you let it become so readily available? And so, um, you know, I think states have been grappling with that issue um, and trying to make choices around how they, how they want it to be in the long run. Um, and, and, and different states will make different decisions. And, you know, I think it's, it's not, um, 
and so, you know, marijuana is maybe sort of a testing ground for how this might work out. Um, and, and so, you know, I think, you know, states are trying things out to see what happens. Um, Thank you. Does someone have a question? Anyway, uh, Dr. Weber, thank you so much for coming in and talking to us. And I'm sure that we'll have some follow-up questions uh, for you potentially after they've had a chance to absorb it or after some of the people have watched the video. So hopefully we might touch base with you and uh, maybe ask a few questions if you're open to that. Yeah, yeah. for sure. All right. So thank you very much. So if we just kind of like either show the applause or just kind of some applause. Yeah. Okay. Very good. So thank you everyone for coming in tonight and thank you, Dr. Uh, Weber again. And so uh, I just really appreciate everyone's uh, time. So thank you very much. Thanks. Bye. See you. Bye, -bye everyone. Bye.